I'm going to show you a, a patient, and then this is the problem with MIS that we see. And there are people that can do it and do it well, and they teach it. That is not necessarily what's per being perpetuated throughout all the communities. I think it's hard to do it well. It's harder to get a good result than it is with an open surgery. There's no question. And so this is the kind of thing that we see coming to us that makes old guys like me think, ah, really should we be doing this? And how many people should be doing this? You can see this particular fracture. Uh, there's a uh, type B fracture with compression, posterior splaying, and a sternal fracture. It's what we showed yesterday. This is an operative fracture. They treated it operatively, but they did an MIS thing. They put a screw above, a screw below, not that good a position, not controlling. Well, they put a little cement in there because that made them feel good for anterior column support. And you can see four months later, there's 42 degrees of kyphosis that despite this, it's collapsing. This, this is MIS in the name of MIS, not MIS in the name of helping patients. And this is a fracture that might have been amenable to proper MIS treatment. <clears throat> so our objectives here are going to find where does, where does MIS surgery fit well into thoracolumbar trauma? And let's look at the controversial areas, really namely burst fractures. I mean, can we do it well in burst fractures? Uh, and what are the issues? So why bother with it? Well, I think OR time, if you look at some studies, the OR time's longer, but as people get good at, the OR time's shorter. So the better you get it, I think we can shorten OR time. But really, is 100 minutes instead of 120, is that of any value to anybody, really? So we have to be careful when we see that as the perpetuated thing. It has value, but in the perspective of comparative value, it's, it's hard to know. The blood loss is less. But if we lose 100 cc's instead of 200 or 300 and we don't transfuse any of the patients, again, it's statistically significant but not valuable to anybody. Uh, less soft tissue damage, that may be valuable. It may be valuable in the long haul. Length of hospital stay, that may be valuable as all well if it's meaningful. If we're talking about half a day, I'm not sure it is. If we're talking about a day or two, then it probably has value. But, you know, can we get correction? In the short term, can we gain the correction? In the long term, can we maintain the correction? Can we return the function quicker? And this, this may be achievable with MIS. And what's the cost? What costs more? So what are the ideal cases? So early on, we talked a lot about damage control. So you get the multi-trauma patient. They don't want you doing a big open surgery with the extra blood loss where it might matter. Uh, and so we would put them in the OR, do perk screws, and then come back and stabilize them. I try not to do this anymore because I thought, wow, that's a great way to do it because we do that with femur fractures now. We just slap an X-fix on and we come back. The problem is, is you've got all these stab holes, you've got all these other wounds, and you make a midline wound to do a definitive surgery, and our infection rate was enormous. And the tissue damage was probably worse because now we, we, we did these perk screws and we opened them. I think we have to be careful about that conceptually and appealing. So we're going to look at these other things, ankylosing spondylitis, bony flexion distraction injuries, non-contiguous fractures, and low lumbars, because I think these are the ideal situations where we can have a great impact with MIS. Ankylosing spondylitis is the number one. It, this is where the MIS surgery has been incredible. It's made all the difference in the world. All the factors that seem to be valuable hold true here. And so in this patient, this is a long bone fracture. This is very different than our other spine fractures. So if we have this fracture, okay, we don't need to open the fracture. The fracture is going to heal. We don't need a fusion because the rest of the spine is fused. We just need to achieve and maintain alignment while it heals. We can place the hardware percutaneously in this fracture. And I might as well be talking about a femur now. We can spread the fixation out over a long area and get long lever arms. We don't need a lot of screws. We don't need a lot of rigidity. In fact, a little play in it might be good, just like this. And so that patient, we do multiple fixation points. We spread them out. We just do it percutaneously. We have long lever arms, and that fracture is going to heal. You don't even have to take the hardware out because the fracture is healed, and we're not trying to restore mobility. I would postulate this is the perfect percutaneous case and is probably should be, become our standard of care for angst spawn patients. Type B, flexion distraction injuries. I think this is an opportunity to do well. It seems ideal for this because all you have to do is close down the posterior tension band, realign the bone, 
And particularly in a PEDS patient, we can expect this fracture is going to heal and we can take the hardware out. It's an internal brace. It's a beautiful opportunity for MIS in the PEDS patient. What about adults? Okay, so the adults, it's usually not in the lumbar spine like the kids. It's usually in the thoracolumbar junction. It's usually not a seatbelt injury. And in those patients, you can do a one or two level fusion. I mean, it doesn't really matter if we fuse one or two levels at the thoracolumbar junction as opposed to maintain mobility. I, I think probably not. This, this doesn't take very long. This, this doesn't take any longer than perk screws, really. Um, the blood loss from that's not very great. And you know who really cares if you lose one or two motion segments in the thoracolumbar junction? It's not functionally detrimental, and you don't have to remove the hardware. So maybe, maybe it's technology over reason, even though it seems like a pretty good opportunity to do perk screws. That it would work. There are circumstances when I think it is valuable. Let's take this young male, high energy multi trauma. He's got a Seiko H fracture. He's got multiple fractures. So, you know, when we get to go to the OR with him to fix his sacral H fracture, which is probably a bigger deal for him, at the same time, you know, we want to minimize his surgery because we don't want to be in there and this is going to be hard work. We just perk the upper one. So, at the same time we do that, we just put percutaneous screws in. You see, we even over reduced him. Uh, and, you know, at times that'll heal. We could eventually take that hardware out. At this point, we actually have already taken out his spinal pelvic fixation at the same time and remobilize him. I showed this patient yesterday another good opportunity, multiple non-contiguous fractures that you don't want to do a long fusion on. And we want to fuse that first fracture because I still, in my hands, feel like I get better results. But we, we looked at this yesterday and saw all these multiple operative, unstable, conti non-contiguous fractures, thoracic spine. And then that patient, we do an open procedure and fusion in the lumbar and perk screw the rest of the fractures. So an internal brace. And here she is two years after the hardware removal of the perk part, not the fused part, because we take this out at six months before their secondary facet change. And this isn't fused yet. So we just cut it and take it out, remobilize that part. Again, seems like a good opportunity for MIS. In the low lumbar spine, again, an ideal place to be thinking about percutaneous non-fusion surgeries because this is a 64-year-old, otherwise healthy male. And in West Virginia, we know that fall has arrived, not because the leaves start to fall, but that the hunters start to fall from the trees, okay, from tree stands. And this guy fell 25 feet from his deer stand. He's neuro intact. He's got some rib fractures, pneumothorax. He has a sternal fracture, common new left distal radius. Multiple injured patient with two level fracture, some spinous process. Maybe this is in the B category, but it's probably really two bursts. You look at that alignment, it's not bad, but probably that's going to be a problem. He needs to mobilize, and these are probably going to collapse. This is a perfect situation to just percutaneous screws as an internal brace, maintain the alignment. Once he heals at six months, we take his hardware out. One year after hardware removal, he's normal activity, has no pain, and a nice mobile spine with reasonable alignment. So, you know, remobilization is probably important in the lumbar spine. I, I don't know how important it is at the thoracolumbar junction, really. Okay, so I think we have to be careful where we don't get technology over reason. So those are examples where I think MIS can really have value for us. Now, what about in the burst fracture? particularly burst fractures without deficits. So what are our goals of treatment? We want to restore and maintain satisfactory alignment. Restore and maintain. Okay, that's important. Because it's not just about what we have post-op. We want to protect the neuro elements, minimize late pain and function. We want to do it in a safe, cost-effective manner. Remember, most of these can be treated non-operatively with decent results. So we've got to be able to really show some value to spend all the extra money. And if we do operate, I would postulate if you're going to take some of the OR, you better leave the OR with the thing aligned. Okay, it better have value. To go in and partially correct them, I can partially correct them non-operatively. So, so some of the issues are how many levels do you do? Because we tend with MIS to just do one above and one below. That, that may not be enough. 
How do we correct alignment with monoaxial or polyaxial screws? Almost all the MIS systems are polyaxials. And the mechanism of the cantilever correction is different. There are some fixed angled screws. You can lock down the tulip head and make it fixed angle and then cantilever it. There are ways to do it, but, but it's important to understand. Do you need any fusion? Do we do MIS and try to fuse it or not? What about removable screws? Should we leave them in, let them loosen if they become symptomatic? Let them loosen. How much is the cost? And is this just for surgical bursts? In other words, for bursts that we said this is a surgical burst? Or are we doing it in all bursts with a concept of internal bracing? And all those are questions. These are I threw these in in case you wanted. They're just three reviews, meta-analysis of some of the data in recent years. And some of these papers I'm going to show you. So if you look at non-operative versus operative treatment, thoracolumbar bursts without deficit, and you do a meta-analysis, there's no difference between operative and non-operative treatment in many of the outcome data. You can get a little better improvement in alignment, 10 degrees, with operative treatment. And if you look at Kirk Wood's data, at 17 years, his outcomes were no different. Still at 17 years. Remember, when Kirk did these, this is 20-year-old fixation. These are hooks, usually three above, two below, often creating flat backs. And so it may be that if we use modern techniques, we can get better outcomes by fixing them. I, I don't know yet, uh, but we have to keep that in mind. And then we have to look at the MIS data and say, OK, oh yeah, this study said from a retrospective review of our 21 patients at two years, we found it to be safe and effective in the treatment of fractures. Pretty off, 17 degrees. In the US, that's a non-op fracture. In the end, it was 14 degrees. That's a, an awful lot of work for three degrees. Now, you can say, well, we would have settled the 20 degrees. That's an awful lot of work for six degrees, OK? So all right, so let's put cement in them. And you look at this paper and say, OK, we could probably hold that better. But I want you to look again. Preoperative kyphosis, average 13 degrees, non-op fracture here. The mean post-op, they have 10 degrees of correction, and they lose a couple degrees. So by adding the cement, maybe they lost less. But again, it, this is a different group of patients that we're often treating in North America. So what about the role of fusion? And people have looked at this, and they said, OK, do we need to fuse them or not? And they said that in their group, between fusion and non-fusion, these are actually all open patients. There was no clinical or radiographic difference at two years. And I would postulate to you, when it comes to fusion, the outcomes may be important over three to five years. OK, so I think, again, we have to take it with caution. But maybe we don't have to fuse them. This is another study adding cement. Um, but again, when you look at these data, this one has no comparison group. So it's hard to make sense of. If we look at some more modern stuff, and we look at treatment by short segment, percutaneous instrumentation, and this is a two-year follow-up between a percutaneous group and an open group. And what we see is, again, they're talking about 10 degrees of kyphosis that they correct to 2 to 4 degrees in both groups and maintain. Again, this is a group of non-operative fractures for us. If we look at this study, this is a study that compares uh, re reduction and retention of thoracolumbar fractures by MIS versus open. And again, I want to draw attention to this, because this is the problem I have with all this study. We see there are examples of open and closed, and both of those I'm treating non-operatively. Now, now maybe what we talked about yesterday with Jens's patient, maybe 15 to 20 degrees of kyphosis 15, 20 years down the road, because they have to hyperlordose is going to create stenosis. But I'd be leery of it in the first five to 10 years creating any problems. Uh, so we're looking, at, we're, we're looking at very, very minor fractures, one level above and below. So we need to restore and maintain alignment. And it's, as you can see, it's difficult to get full correction with the current technology. And so that's where we have to direct our attention. Short segment fixation in open fused patients tend to lose correction. So even prior to instrumentation, you often lose things. And often the perk stuff is, is one level above and below. 
Uh, and fusion, you have to remember, in the thoracolumbar junction is not that big a deal. It's not a big deal probably till you get below L3. People are getting better and they're writing about it. And they're writing, how do we get better at correcting it? How do we get better at maintaining it? This is a paper on technique with focal, you know, MIS, anterior interbody fusions, that they may be able to start to maintain it and get better corrections and then maintain it in the long haul with some fusion technique added anteriorly. If you look at this paper, this is probably the best one I've come across. Uh, and it's, it looks at three groups. Conservative treatment, non-operative treatment, open treatment, and MIS. And if you look at their kyphosis, they're in the 25-degree range. So suddenly we've got a paper that is in a, in a group that we might consider to treat surgically. And they compare them. If you notice, their ODIs at 18 and 30 months are substantially better in both the open and MIS group. So this is actually a paper that starts to make you think that maybe at least treating them. Now, here's the difference. All of them, two above and two below. So in this paper, they were probably, with two above, two below, able to maintain and get correction and maintain it better. These aren't short segment constructs. Uh, but it is in, in the range that we might do. All the hardware was removed in both groups, six to 12 months. So conclusions, so MIS, it has a role in thoracolumbar trauma. It's here to stay. There are patients where the role is easy to define, I think, and we use it for those. I don't think there are any new indications for surgery in burst fractures yet, okay? So I don't know that we should be treating things that we would have otherwise treated non-operatively just because we can do an MIS procedure. I think the non-op treatment is still the mainstay. I don't even use a brace for burst fractures, so I'm not sure the concept of internal brace means much to me. Uh, but maybe 15 degrees of kyphosis reduced over 10 to 20 years, maybe it will be better. Maybe it is better. And I, and I think we need to continue to look at that. And if you do surgery, if you feel like you need to do it, you need to correct the alignment and maintain it. If you're going to expose the patient to the rest of the surgery, this is still more difficult with MIS techniques. Thanks. Outstanding.